Yes, once again, uh, we will have some pauses for conversation uh, at different times through the next uh, hour and a half, and I think quite a bit of time at the end for some uh, discussion, reflections and so on. And thank you for the positive feedback, but please do also raise questions and concerns and disagreements. Uh, this is a conversation, and uh, we need one another's help to understand some of the issues, I think. I want to continue to explore some of the same issues that we looked at earlier, but to focus particularly on the role of the community, the Christian community, in the task of nurturing and sustaining disciples. And simply to say that the uh, journey we are on as followers of Jesus is not meant to be a journey that we take alone. We are not individual pilgrims, we are fellow travellers on the road. We become fully human only within community. And it is in the community that we develop some of the countercultural reflexes we were talking about earlier, and where we learn to live Christianly and learn to reflect on all aspects of our lives together. But we live in a very individualistic culture. We live in a culture that doesn't really affirm the kind of community that I've been talking about. And so just to talk about journeying together, to talk about a community shaping us, is somewhat countercultural. It flies in the face of an individualistic, don't tell me what to do type of culture. And I would suggest that that uh, culture of individualism has pervaded our churches. Not that that's new, but I think it becomes ever more a reality. Just think about some indicators of that. It's rather different tonight in the way that we're sat round tables. Uh, some of us can actually see each other's faces. But the traditional seating arrangement in churches is almost designed to prevent community. You know, we sit in rows, we can only see the backs of each other's heads. If you are in a building with fixed pews or fixed seats, Trying to do interactive stuff is damaging to your health because you're falling over the furniture. There's just something about the architecture and the, the, the seating layout that is not conducive to community. And you know that old uh, fight that many churches have about ch how you lay out the chairs? You know, you can sort of think, oh, it's such a stupid little issue. Why do we fight about that? Actually, it's a very important issue. And I think people realise that. And that's why sometimes they dig their heels in. Because if you change the seating so you actually can see each other, it changes the whole dynamic of the community. Or monologue sermons with no opportunity for dialogue. What does that do in terms of building community or enhancing individualism? The practice in some churches of tithing, which is an entirely individualistic way of dealing with your finances. It doesn't require any kind of conversation about lifestyle or our instinctive resistance to any kind of accountability processes. We don't really need each other, do we? So I think within our churches, the spirit of individualism that is strong in our culture has also made quite an impact. And some of the things I want to talk about this evening are going to challenge that and question that, and ask to what extent we have bought into an aspect of our culture that's not very good for us. Of course, it's not new. Pilgrim's Progress, one of the great classics, translated into many languages. Many of you, I guess, will have read it. Well, it's a wonderful book in many ways, but it is highly individualistic. This is a heroic pilgrim on his way to the Shining City. Yes, from time to time he has companions who join him. Sometimes they're helpful and sometimes they're not. But essentially it's a story of a pilgrim. A pilgrim journeying by himself towards a celestial city. Many other spiritual classics also seem to inculcate this very individualistic understanding of discipleship. Now, I'm not suggesting that's entirely wrong. There is a dimension to which, of course, discipleship is individual. There is a real sense in which it is me and Jesus. But it isn't just me and Jesus. It's me and Jesus and all of us together. One of the things that we need to avoid as we start looking at the relationship between the community and discipleship is creating some kind of dependence culture. A culture that says, well, I can look to others to provide all the resources I need for discipleship. And you know, that's also alive and well in many places. It might be in your church too. The dependence on the sermon. The dependence on an upbeat worship time. 
the dependence simply on meetings, the dependence on the pastor to meet all our pastoral needs, the dependence on <coughs> counsellors to help us through all kinds of emotional crises. And so I'm not wanting to suggest that there is only the community that we need. We need also to take responsibility for discipleship and to build communities that encourage that. I did warn uh, George Lings, who's here, that I was going to quote him. I didn't know he was coming, but I will quote him anyway. It's this phrase, self-propelling disciples. I don't know whether you remember using that, George, but a few years ago at an Incarnate Network conference, again, another gathering of pioneers, someone like this, you used that phrase, and I've quoted it a number of times since because I find it helpful. And uh, another phrase somewhat similar is the, the Willow Creek Community Church in uh, Chicago. Uh, a few years ago, looked at what they were doing, particularly in terms of their seeker-sensitive approach, and said, what we have failed to do is to develop people who will take responsibility as self-feeders. Now, they're different images, but very similar in terms of their import. And both are just raising the concern about the dependency that we can sometimes create in our churches. What we're looking for are self-propelling disciples who take responsibility for their life in Christ, for those who will feed themselves and nourish themselves. But what we're trying to do, I think, what I'm trying to do anyway, is to suggest that we're looking neither for a culture of dependency, nor for a culture of independence, but an interdependency. And that's actually quite a difficult balance to find. And I guess we all, uh, in our communities, struggle somewhere between those different poles. But interdependency that says, yes, we do need each other. This is not simply a journey of heroic individualism. We do need the encouragement, the insights, the resources that the community offers. But we also have something to give. It's not a one-way street. We also have something to bring into the community that will help others. So I want to talk quite a bit uh, this evening about the role of the community, not as a, a church that simply provides everything that disciples need and coddles everybody, but as a living community within which we are all both participating, contributing and receiving. And the, the phrase that I want to work with in particular is to think of our churches as communities of discernment and resistance. If any of you know the writings of uh, Walter Wink, you will perhaps recognise that phrase. Communities of discernment and resistance. Let me take you back again to the uh, phrase that I quoted from Graham Cray earlier, where he talked about our culture being a discipling culture. A culture which is actively promoting certain values and encouraging us to uh, live in certain ways, to spend in certain ways, to embrace certain values and certain expectations. Again, we do not live in a neutral culture. We live in a contested environment. We are, if you like, catechised daily by the adverts that we watch, by the books we read, by the news channel we watch, by the papers that we read, by the films we watch, by all the media. There's a daily catechising going on. And so, the expectation is that we will be good catechumens in our culture, that we will imbibe the stories that we're told, that we will believe these things, that we will take on board the dominant values, and that we will live out as good citizens the things that our culture says are important. I just think we need to be very clear about how powerful this influence is, and how this sets the context for everything we're talking about when we think about discipleship. I believe that we, all of us, are under huge pressure. And that's why I think the ancient practice of detox, exorcism, call it what you will, actually has something going for it. However, we reconfigure that in a changed culture. Now again, I'm not suggesting this is new. I'm not suggesting that we've ever lived in a, a Christian-friendly culture in a holistic sense. But I do think there are three things that have changed, or three things that have become exacerbated. The first of those is what I referred to earlier, the shift from Christendom to post-Christendom. Christendom may have been fairly unchristian in lots of ways, but the language, the values, the assumptions, the stories, somehow were permeated through with Christian language and ethos. And that is changing and has changed. And we're now moving into a context where there is far, far less of that than we've been used to. Secondly, I think the skills of cultural discipling have been honed until they become extremely powerful 
and extremely subversive. The amount of money that is spent on the advertising industry is phenomenal. It's extremely clever, extremely skillful, and it's very difficult for us to grapple with unless we take some pretty uh, firm action. I want to come back to that. And the trouble is that most of it is undetected. Most of it seems to be getting inside us without us realising it. And thirdly, the dominant worldview, the worldview that seems to be prevalent in our culture, which defines us primarily as consumers and which emphasises human rights rather than human responsibilities, I would suggest is profoundly dehumanising. That it actually pushes us away from becoming fully human and not towards it. And so, although this issue is not new, I would suggest that it's strong, it's pervasive, and it's making it very difficult for us to build Christian communities of countercultural disciples. And simply going to church won't do it. We may well have seen this before. Simply turning up at meetings, simply going through the motions, even participating enthusiastically, by itself perhaps won't be sufficient. I think we need to go beyond that. So I'm going to, I suggest what we need are these communities, let's go back to that, of discernment and resistance. If we're to resist or even discern the influences of our culture, I think we will need each other. I don't subscribe to the idea of heroic Christian discipleship. I just don't think that's where we're at. I think we need to be part of communities where we can journey together. We need to belong to communities that will tell a different story that will celebrate that story in worship, that will explore the implications of that story in discipleship, and that will, albeit imperfectly, live out the values of that story. I think the, the place of story is so important. There are so many competing stories in our culture, but there is also a kind of dominant story that our culture tells. And we need to tell a different story and a better story. And we need to rehearse that story in our communities over and over again, Again, to use the phrase I used earlier, we need to out-narrate our culture. We need to tell a better story. And we need communities that will help us to discern contemporary idols and ideologies. What is worshipped in our society? What is worshipped in our local community? We need communities that will help us to interpret the stories that are told within our culture. So as well as telling our own story, to interpret the other stories that are being told to dig beneath the surface, to unmask the principalities and powers, to use the language of the New Testament. What's going on around us? I believe that's the prophetic role of the church, but also I believe it's our pastoral responsibility to each other. We need each other in this. And we need each other because none of us is going to see everything. None of us is going to have the, the skills and the tools to interpret such a diverse culture. We need the resources of the Christian community. We need communities of discernment and resistance. So what kinds of things might such churches do? As, as well as preaching sermons and singing songs and praying prayers and serving donuts and whatever else fresh expressions now do, what else? What does it mean to be a community of discernment and resistance? Let me suggest just a, a handful of community practices. Some of these may appeal more than others. One thing that I would suggest we do need to do is to do some clear work on advertisements. I believe the power of the advertising industry is one of the great cultural shapers. And I don't think we can just sit back and ignore it. I think we need to do something. What would you do when the adverts come on in the middle of a programme you're watching? Well, there are various options. You can mute, just turn it down. You can go make a cup of tea. You can sort of watch and just let it all flow over you. Or you can engage with the adverts. And I've chosen to, to do that over the last few years. Only my wife can tell you how irritating I am to watch television with. <laughs> I shout at the adverts. I laugh at them. I mock them. I argue with them. I deconstruct them. She gets a bit fed up with it sometimes, I think, but she's very gracious. But I just feel, unless I do something proactively, I am going to be infiltrated by the values that these adverts keep throwing at me. Because you're worth it. 
What does that mean? And I think we need one another's help to do this. And so I do wonder whether as part of our liturgy, we might deconstruct adverts, films, other forms of media. Seriously. I'm not currently responsible for leadership in a local church. I'm a member of a church, uh, but I'm not in a leadership role at present locally. Uh, if I were, I would want to do this, probably weekly. I think it's so important that we understand and unmask what's going on. And I think it could be done creatively, prayerfully, as really part of our offering to God. Saying, Lord, help us to see what's going on here. Help us to live by a different story than the stupid stories these adverts tell. What about an idol of the week slot? Encouraging people to bring into the context of worship their experiences of idolatry during the past week or two. What have you seen that people have worshipped? What have you worshipped? What have I worshipped? Opportunities for theological reflection on issues at work. I mentioned earlier that for many, many people there is a disconnect between church and work. The church doesn't seem to be a resource for them. And that's one of the reasons given by people who opt out of church, that the church doesn't seem relevant to the context in which they spend most of their waking hours. Well, I think we need to find ways of addressing that issue. Uh, something that we have begun to do in the church in Bristol that I'm part of is from time to time to invite people, just very simply, to talk about their work, to talk about some of the issues they're facing, some of the questions that their work throws up for them, to do a little bit of reflection and prayer. It's very simple, but it's just the beginnings, the sort of shallow end, I think, of what we need to do. Opportunities for prayerful discussions of current issues. One of the other reasons people sometimes give for dropping out of church is that the church doesn't really seem to be connected with what's going on in the world outside it. That came through very starkly to me a few years ago when I remember talking to somebody, or actually listening rather than talking to somebody, whose last church meeting was the Sunday after 9-11. They went to church that Sunday in Britain, this wasn't in the US, and their experience was that nothing was said about what had happened during the week. It wasn't mentioned, it didn't come into the sermon, the prayers, anything. It was as if it hadn't happened. And they walked away from church that Sunday saying, I do not want to live in a ghetto. I do not want to be part of a community that does not engage with what's happening in the world around us. Now I'm not suggesting, and this person wasn't suggesting, that our Sunday gatherings, or whenever we meet, should be driven by whatever's in the news that week. That's not what I'm suggesting. But when you've got something that everybody around you is talking about, not to engage with it in any way, it just seems odd. I then had uh, conversations also with one or two church leaders about their experience of the Sunday after 9-11. And it was interesting listening to them as they talked about being unsure what to do. You know, what do you say? How do you pray? And in particular, how do you worship? What kind of songs do you sing the Sunday after 9-11? And one at least was honest enough to say that uh, he had looked through his collection of songs and couldn't find anything suitable. They were all upbeat. There was nothing that seemed appropriate. So there's something about reality, there's something about integrity, there's something about connectivity, there's something about having the resources to engage more widely with these issues. And finding ways of developing community support for countercultural choices and decisions. That when people do have the courage to take risks, to do things that seem to go against mainstream culture, rather than to marginalise them or to sort of, well, back off a bit and hope it isn't going to be too much of a disaster, to actually offer some support and encouragement. Those of you who are pioneers need the support of the community. You need people who will believe in you, who will stand with you even when what you're doing is new and fresh and who knows what's going to happen. It's back to the freedom to fail. 
Do we give people that freedom within our communities? So I'm suggesting that if we're going to develop the kinds of communities of discernment and resistance that I believe we need, if we're going to nurture disciples in a fairly challenging environment, that these and other community practices are the kinds of things we might need to think about. And if we don't want meetings that go on and on and on and on for hours, then maybe certain things we need to stop doing to make room for some of these things. This isn't about adding extra bits. It's really about asking, why do we meet together? What was it for? And of course, there are a variety of reasons that you can give for that. But one of the New Testament reasons that comes again and again is we meet to build one another up. Yes, we meet to worship God, we meet to hear the story and a variety of other things, but we meet to build one another up, to edify one another. And this seems to me to be part of that. And building one another up, helping one another to grow in maturity as followers of Jesus and as human beings. So I just offer these to you as examples, no more than that, but just examples of the kinds of things that I think our communities might need to do. And of course, if you are in a pioneering situation, you might have the freedom to do some of these things, or other things. You might have the opportunity not to do some of the things that churches always do, to make space for these. That's one of the joys of pioneering. You know, you'll no doubt encounter some opposition, but that's part of the joy of pioneering too. Okay, first opportunity for some conversation around the tables. We've been going uh, long enough for the dessert to have begun to settle, so a little bit of interaction will be good. What do you think of these community practices? Would any of those make sense in your context? What else have you done, or might you do? I want to move on to something different but connected. Barney mentioned earlier that I'm very interested in multi-voiced approaches to church life. And the kinds of activities that I've been talking about already sort of presuppose that our communities are going to allow room for many voices to participate. And I want to suggest that actually all aspects of church life would benefit from being more multi-voiced than they often are. And I think that's something that many fresh expressions and emerging churches have either intentionally or instinctively discovered that there is a greater freedom for people to participate than there often was in older forms of church. And I think that multi-voiced communities are much more likely to nurture and sustain discipleship. My wife and I have written on this subject. There's a book over there on the bookstore if you're interested in exploring it further. But we have worked with this over a number of years and we have a number of convictions about this. One is that multi-voiced communities are more consistent with a biblical ecclesiology than mono-voiced churches. Secondly, that they are more likely to produce mature disciples. And thirdly, that they are more missionally potent. I want to say a bit particularly about those second two, uh, second two things. So by multi-voiced community, multi-voiced church, what we mean is an alternative to the dominant tradition where it is largely one voice, or a very small number of voices, which are heard within the church. Where Christian community has become, for many people, a place of passive consumption, rather than active participation. Where things are done to them, or said to them, rather than them being active participants. So multi-voice community is one which has the expectation that many voices will be heard that many gifts will be shared, that the resources of the whole community will be made available to that community. And where space is made for that to happen, where people are equipped and resourced and enabled to participate. We believe that multi-voice communities are important for a number of reasons. One of those is to do with culture shift, that we are moving into a culture where multi-voice community just makes sense where there is a reluctance to rely upon the one voice, the expert, where there is increasingly a participative ethos, where the, the monologue is actually a fairly rare experience within our culture, particularly an unchallengeable monologue. And so culturally, in a postmodern environment, it just seems to us to make sense. That doesn't make it right, but one of the things that I think happens whenever our culture goes through a bit of a shift is that it gives us the opportunity to reflect theologically 
biblically on what we are currently doing and ask, why are we doing this? Is this the biblical pattern? Is this the historic practice that we must maintain at all costs? Or perhaps have we been unduly influenced by cultures in the past? And now that our culture is changing, we can perhaps see some things more clearly. There are practical reasons as well. We are in a period of church decline. And it doesn't look as if that decline is going to stop anytime soon. The figures uh, vary over the years, but overall we continue to decline. That doesn't mean that all churches everywhere are declining, of course not. And Fresh Expressions is often presented as one of the signs of hope, that in the midst of decline there are actually all kinds of new things happening. There are new shoots springing up, and that's encouraging. But overall we are continuing to decline, and our resources are becoming fewer. And one of the implications of that is that full-time paid ministry is not going to be an option for a growing number of congregations over the next few years. Uh, that's affecting all denominations, and it's likely to continue. One of the implications for me of that is that we may need to simplify church, that we may not be able to sustain all that we've done in the past, but also that we will need the multi-voiced community to step up, that we will not be able to rely as much as we have done on those few people who have done most things. It will need to be much more of a shared community. We believe it's important also because I think it reduces dependency. I think the mono-voiced model tends to promote dependency rather than challenging it, whereas a multi-voiced approach encourages interdependency, encourages the sharing of resources with one another. We do also believe it is simply the biblical pattern and we do some work in the book looking at evidence for that in Old and New Testament, that actually that is the kind of community gifted by the Spirit that we seem to see in the pages of Scripture. Some of the things that I talked about earlier, I think multi-voice community could make some inroad into. So biblical and theological illiter illiteracy. To be a participative community, I think, begins to address that issue. There's also the chronic stress levels on many clergy who, with diminishing resources, are expected somehow to keep doing everything they've done and perhaps more. I think there are real dangers if we rely too heavily on just a few within the community. I want to suggest also that it does have some significance for mission. My suggestion is that those who are participators, that's not a word, is it? Participants in a multi-voiced community are far more likely, if they've been talking about their faith within the community, to talk about it outside. They're far more likely, if they have been exercising mutual pastoral care within the community, to be pastorally alert to issues in the neighbourhood. If they're participants rather than spectators, rather than consumers, I just think that it is more likely that they will be actively involved in mission beyond the community. So for a, a range of reasons, uh, our conviction and our suggestion is that a multi-voiced approach to church life is good for discipleship, is good for mission, is good for those who have leadership responsibilities. It does require a shift of gear in terms of what the role of the leader is. What we're not saying is that we don't need leadership. We're saying very firmly, yes, we still need leadership, but it's leadership that is more about empowering and coordinating. It's less about doing everything. And my impression is that that's actually already pretty evident within many emerging churches and many fresh expressions of church, that actually this is the way that the wind is blowing. But I might be wrong on that. So again, I want to encourage you to have a, a conversation. What do you think? How significant is this? Is this just some kind of internal thing? Oh, let's have a multi-voice church? Or does it really have the kind of significance for discipleship and for mission that I've suggested. And how do you respond to it, particularly those of you who have leadership? Is this something you welcome, or do you think this sounds like hard work? You know, it's hard enough doing everything myself. If I've got to find a way of getting everybody involved, that just sounds like the straw that's going to break the camel's back. It's only worth investing in, and it will take time and energy to actually move in that direction. It's only worth investing in if the outcomes, if you like, are worth it. If the kind of community that emerges is going to be healthier and more sustainable.
than uh, what we have at present. So again, conversation around the tables. By the way, if you've got fed up with a person that you've been talking to for the last three or four sessions, just feel free to move around and uh, invade another table. <laughs> Look at one other area, also interrelated area, really. I want us to think about the interrelated issues of individualism, consumerism, and accountability. There, if you weren't asleep before now, this looks like a sleep inducing final section. But I want to go back to something I said quite early on in the first session the interrelated issues of individualism and consumerism. And I think you'll see in a moment just how they connect together. Both of these, I think, are absolutely crucial for. Uh, our practices of discipleship. How do we work within a culture that is individualistic? And what do we do about the issue of consumerism? I want to point you first of all to one of the least popular passages in the New Testament. If you don't know it, look it up. But it's one of only two passages in the Gospels where the word church is found. Only twice the word church appears on the lips of Jesus. In Matthew 16, Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, which is great news, but doesn't tell us much detail. <laughs> and then two chapters later, we find the word church again in this passage, where Jesus says, this is how you're to behave when things go wrong in the community. If your brother or sister sins against you, this is the way you are to respond. And it's a passage that has been described in various ways over the centuries. The kind of classic description of this passage is to call it church discipline, which does sound rather punitive and threatening. So let's give it a more cuddly name, shall we? Let's call it interactive pastoral care. <laughs> so you like the passage now, after all. The uh, Anabaptist tradition that I draw from quite extensively uh, refers to this passage simply as the rule of Christ. This is how Christ wants us to live within our communities. And within the Anabaptist tradition, at your baptism, you committed yourself to this process. You were baptised into a community where you said publicly, brothers and sisters, I need your help to be a disciple of Jesus. Will you help me on the journey? And this passage was very much at the heart of their understanding of that. And the passage, which is incredibly short, and simply raises all manner of questions about how it works in practice. But the passage essentially says to us, we cannot do it alone. We need one another, which is something I guess I've been saying in a variety of ways through these two sessions. We need accountability structures if we're to be faithful followers of Jesus. I think Jesus is essentially saying two things to us here. First of all, in a community, there is bound to be, from time to time, conflict. We're going to hurt each other. We're going to upset each other. We're going to offend each other. Why? Because we're not yet saints. We are actually a community of recovering sinners. And we will screw up. We will say things and do things which will hurt each other. And we need to have processes that will enable us not to destroy each other, but to bring healing and reconciliation. I think he's also talking about the journey of discipleship that we're all on, and perhaps asking us to consider whether we think we can go it alone, or whether we might need our brothers and sisters' help. Are you confident, am I confident, that for the rest of our human lives, we are going to be wholeheartedly faithful to Jesus? Or do we think it's possible that we might sin, backslide, fall short, wander off the track, and might actually need the help of a brother or sister to bring us back. I think those are the kinds of issues that this passage raises for us. So I think this is all about discipleship. I think it's about being part of a community that enables and restores and helps. And I know it can seem a very threatening passage, but I think that's because it's so often been practiced badly. And just because it's been practiced badly doesn't mean it can't be practiced well. But I'm fully aware that in an individualistic culture and individualistic churches, this does not initially seem like good news. It feels as if this is so countercultural and so dangerous that it might be damaging for us. And the danger, I think, is we, we somehow think this is all about being judgmental. If your brother or sister sins against you, go to them. 
I don't know how often you watch The Simpsons, but I think there are some wonderful episodes in The Simpsons. And I want to affirm what somebody said earlier, there's actually good stuff as well in our culture that we need to learn from, resonate with. Uh, I don't know if you remember this particular incident, but Homer Simpson, if you don't watch The Simpsons, just blank out for a minute, it doesn't matter. Homer Simpson is talking to his uh, evangelical neighbour, Ned Flanders. I can't remember what about. But in the middle of the conversation, Ned's wife, Maud, I think, comes back and comes in with the conversation. And Homer asks her where she's been. And she says, I've been off to this wonderful Christian convention, learning how to be more judgmental. <laughs> and it's just one of those moments when you sort of go, ouch. If this passage, and if what I'm saying is about our church is becoming more judgmental, then I want to run a mile from it. That's not what we need. And of course we live in a culture that is extremely attuned to judgmentalism. The one thing you mustn't be in our culture is judgmental. I don't think it's anything to do with being judgmental. I think it's to do with a pastoral care for each other that is prepared to go the second mile, that is prepared to take difficult decisions, prepared to voice uncomfortable things because of a commitment to one another. I think it's an essential part of nurturing and sustaining disciples. But I also think that it's not something you can just do. Now, please do not go back and say, oh, you know, we have this conference, the breakout conference, and we heard all about Matthew 18. Let's do it this morning. That would be a disaster. That is not the way this works. All I'm suggesting is that this might be the kind of process, the kind of community practice that a community could begin to work around, could begin to talk about and pray through. And again, if you're involved in a pioneering situation, you might want to introduce this as one of the foundations of the church. One of the difficulties so often is the way this is used is in communities that don't know how to practice it. And then it's done badly. And then it gets a bad reputation. And it makes things worse rather than better. So this is not something you can just suddenly introduce, but it's, it's a process that I think is tremendously important for disciple making. Just give you two examples. A church that I uh, used to know fairly well, uh, up in Yorkshire, I've not been there for a little while, spent time wrestling together with this passage and asking, what does this mean for us as a community? It's the only church building I've ever been to where they have Matthew 18, 15 to 17, written up on the wall in big letters. And they say, when we fall out with each other, this is what we're going to do. I just found that quite remarkable. You might not think it's very user-friendly for people who walk in for the first time, but it was a commitment of the community. And the church that uh, my wife and I are part of in Bristol uh, asked us to do some teaching around this at the beginning of the year, in January. We did a couple of Sunday uh, meetings where we explored this in some uh, detail. What might this mean? And uh, thankfully the church didn't decide to practice it the following week. What they did do was to begin a process of talking together as a church and have now come out with some written guidelines, which the community has agreed. This is the way we want to live together as a community. I simply commend it to you. I think it's important. I think it's something which is uh, neglected because it's so often been badly practiced. But I think it is life-giving. And it is, as far as we can tell, uh, how Jesus expects us to practice community. Actually, there are a growing number of examples of churches that are introducing some forms of accountability processes. It may not be based on Matthew 18 necessarily, but I'm interested that accountability seems to be becoming more common. I had a couple of conversations earlier about the uh, Life Shapes programme that uh, Thomas Crooks up in Sheffield has uh, popularised. Uh, if you don't know that, then uh, ask someone who does know about it. But two or three years ago, a group of Baptist ministers in Yorkshire uh, decided they wanted to explore the Life Shapes material and the processes that have come out of that, which are all about mutual accountability, and asked me to journey with them as a kind of external reflector to understand with them what was going on, to talk with them about their experiences of this. Uh, Life Shapes, if you don't know, um, uses a variety of geometrical shapes in order to talk about different aspects of discipleship. And the experience of the Baptist ministers who were involved in this process was fairly mixed in terms of their enjoyment or otherwise of Life Shapes. Some really liked them, some didn't. But what they all liked was the process known as huddling. 
They didn't necessarily like the name particularly, but a huddle is a, an accountability group. And they form themselves into a huddle for this process. And within this fairly structured environment, opportunities for people to uh, ask quite significant questions of one another in a supportive but accountable framework. And the mantra, as some of you will know, for this process is high accountability, low control. High accountability, low control. So it's not about controlling one another or telling one another what to do, but it's about holding one another accountable to the things that you have committed to do or to be. And the group of Baptist ministers I was working with found this a tremendously helpful process. And during the process, I'd already begun to work within their churches using something similar. The Inspire Network, which has grown out of uh, Methodism but is now uh, connecting with people in a variety of places, draws on some classic Methodist processes and practices, again, to help us to find ways of being accountable in ways that are life-giving rather than constricting. The interest in new monasticism that we talked about briefly earlier. Within the new monastic tradition is a recovery of certain processes of accountability with soul friends and spiritual directors and practices that enable you not to journey alone but to journey together. I think in the context of an individualistic culture, this is quite surprising, the level of interest, but really quite encouraging. We don't journey alone. Well, what about consumerism? If mammon, which is the only spirit that Jesus actually names in the New Testament, is as dominant within our culture as I suspect it is, then I suggest that we need to address this issue of discipleship very directly and very persistently. That to talk about discipleship without engaging with this is probably not to take it seriously. I think I'd put it as strongly as that. And if we can nurture discipleship in this area, if we can do that well and faithfully, I think the implications for other areas of discipleship could be considerable. So yes, I want us to be rude and to talk about money and lifestyle, which is not something that many of our churches enjoy talking about. Now again, that depends on context. Middle class Christians don't like talking about money. Working class churches don't mind at all. Other cultures often don't mind talking about money. Uh, Travelling in uh, Southeast Asia earlier this year, one of the questions you're regularly asked is, what do you earn? It's not normally the first question you're asked when you turn up a church in a middle class environment. It's a huge subject biblically. Something, someone's calculated that something like one in every seven verses in the Bible is to do with money, possessions, giving, sharing, lifestyle. And the biblical writers don't seem to be averse to talking very directly about these sorts of issues. But it is very difficult to get Christians in many churches talking about these things. I've tested that out in one or two places. As you know, I like the kind of interactive multi-voice stuff. And so I sometimes said, not very often, but just from time to time where I've felt a bit mischievous, I've sometimes said, just for two or three minutes, turn to the person next to you and talk around these sorts of issues. What do you earn? What do you give away? What did you spend on your holiday this year? <laughs> What's very interesting is nobody ever does it. There's a kind of shocked silence. And people, even if they're used to me and the kind of interactive stuff I do, they, oh, this is a bit beyond the pale. Why can't we do this? It seems that people will be more comfortable talking about their sex lives to each other and about these money issues. It's the great taboo in many of our churches. Now again, context varies. In the kind of church that I belong to, it wouldn't be an issue, I don't think. But in often more affluent churches, it's very difficult to talk about these things. And I just wonder whether that is simply colluding with individualism and consumerism. Why can't we talk about these things? And part of the issue is that we live in an incredibly wealthy part of a very poor and unjust world. We are the beneficiaries of a culture that is only sustainable because of violence and the threat of violence. It's what Walter Brueggemann calls military consumerism. We need to talk about these things. They are issues of global discipleship. So I want to suggest that we do talk about these issues, that we talk about what we earn, 
how we earn it, what we spend, what we save, where we live, why we vote as we do, what are the lifestyle issues we're facing, how we make financial choices, how we tackle issues of wealth and poverty, what does it mean to be a disciple in a consumerist society. If we don't talk about these things, they remain hidden, and mammon rules, I believe. I also think we need to experiment. I think we need to be creative, I think we need to be outrageously generous, and I think we need to have some fun. And if some of the things I've been saying sound a little bit heavy, let me try and lighten things. I think we need to have some godly fun with our finances. I think we need to play. And I think we need to laugh at the idiocy of consumerism and of mammon. Idols cannot bear to be laughed at. One of the ways of dethroning mammon is to poke fun at the pretensions of a consumer society. Let me just briefly tell you, you may, some of you may know the story already, of uh, some fun that some Christians in Australia had. There's somebody here from Australia, is that right? Okay. I'm, okay, do you know about the Fremantle Jubilee? No. Ah, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, it's a long way. It is a long way, isn't it? Fremantle is the port uh, near Perth in Western Australia. Uh, it's the first place that you would land if you came in from that side of the, of the continent. And uh, a few years ago, churches in Fremantle, which is you know, a sizable town, not a, not a big city, but a sizable town, began to really get exercised about the biblical teaching on Jubilee. And they began to ask the question, how could we practice Jubilee today in our context? It's a longer story that I'm telling, but essentially what they decided to do, and they worked together across denominational boundaries, what they decided to do was effectively to have some fun with their finances. And they raised enough money to pay off all the utility bills, all the debts for everybody in the city. <laughs> so all the water bills, all the outstanding gas and electricity debts were cleared. They also, I think, did some work in terms of rent arrears. I can't remember all the details. What a crazy thing to do. You know, thousands and thousands of Australian dollars. Except that it began to catch on. It began to get people's imagination. And local businesses and local councillors and others began to get behind this and began to say, what a wonderful initiative. Absolutely stupid thing to do, because many of those who had their debts cleared will be back in debt again within a few weeks. You know, they haven't learned anything. It's not been some sort of process of helping people keep out of debt. It's just an outrageously generous, stupid, creative, humorous thing to do. I just think it's got something of the kingdom about it. You can read about it online if you're interested. The Fremantle Jubilee. That's the kind of thing that I think breaks the whole of mammon. It isn't going to change the world. It isn't even going to change Fremantle. But I think it begins to erode the influence of a consumer culture. So I think we need to talk about money and lifestyle. Maybe over the, in the bar this evening, we could begin that process of talking about money. Let me finish with uh, a personal confession. I tend very strongly towards independence. I simply confess that to you, my brothers and sisters. I don't like much of the stuff I've been talking about. <laughs> I am fairly private. I much prefer um, just to do my own thing, go my own way. Um, I'd actually much prefer to listen to a monologue sermon than I would to do things around the table, if I'm honest. Uh, I just don't think it's good for me. And so I have had to struggle around these issues of accountability because I believe they're important, not because I like them. And so as a church planter back in the 1980s, I invited two people to act as mentors and to provide a measure of accountability for me. And I think they saved me from burnout. As a freelance trainer and consultant, which I am now, I meet regularly with a trusted group of three friends. I meet with them again in 10 days' time. And they have been a tremendous resource to me over the last 10 years. And they're empowered to ask me anything they want to, about ministry, about life, about family, about health. I don't like having that accountability group. I'd rather not go and talk to them next week. But I believe I need to. I believe that's good for me as a disciple. And recognising the power of consumerism, 
one of the things that my wife and I do from time to time is to talk with some friends who we know and trust and simply open up our finances to them and say, look, this is what we're earning, this is what we're spending, this is, these are our outgoings, this is what we're giving, this is what we're saving, what do you think? We're not asking them to make decisions for us, but we're asking them to challenge us, to question us, to affirm things they think are good, but also to poke away at issues that we might need to think about. We find that liberating. We find that helpful. And so I want to end, really, just with this combination of accountability, friendship and discipleship. That everything we've been talking about, everything I've been saying, really, this afternoon and this evening, has been about communities of disciples, not heroic individuals. And I do think we need to have the discipleship conversation within that context. Not to create dependency, I hope you've heard that, but to create communities that are able to nurture and sustain communities into which we are able to contribute, but from which we also receive. That we need to be in places of nurture, support, accountability, but also friendship, where these things are not heavy, where these things are fun, where these things can be enjoyed and experienced in, in, the, in a community of friends.